All right, so the title of my sermon tonight is called Red Flags of Deception. The Red Flags of Deception. And basically what, what I mean by that title is just, I want to try to provide you with a little bit of insight, a little bit of warning into how you can determine if someone's lying to you or not, if someone's trying to deceive you, if someone is being deceptive, there are some things that you can be aware of that liars typically will do in order to convince you of their lies. So we want to be wise. We want to use God's word, especially as a source for our wisdom. And we want to make sure that we're not fools, but we're, that we're wise, that we're wise as serpents, yet harmless as doves. We need to be aware of these things. We need to be aware of these tricks and these traps because a lot of times when people lie to you, they're setting a trap for you. There's a lot of other things that go along with lying. Well, we're going to get into just, just three examples tonight, possibly four, but probably just three examples of things that the Bible talks about or that we could see illustrated through the Bible where people are lying and you could start to get a, um, an understanding here that someone, you know, there's at least some red flags that should be popping up in your mind that should be causing you to doubt and to maybe take a step back and try to figure out if, if this person is lying to you or not. In the first example here in Joshua chapter 9, of course, the children of Israel, this is still the very early on in the book of Joshua where they were commanded to go forth and to start destroying the inhabitants of the land of Canaan because that was the promised land that was to be given unto them and God wanted to dispossess that land from the wicked wicked nations that were living there prior to Israel taking over. Now, they had made these great victories in Jericho and Ai, and some of the people, one of the nations hear, hears about this. They all have he heard about it, but one of them decides, hey, we're going to go and make sure that we don't get destroyed, and we're going to cause them to make a league with us or a pact with us, a deal that says, you know, we're not going to go to war with each other. We're actually going to protect one another and we're going to be on the same side. That's what a league is. That's what they were, they were doing here. And in order to do that, they had to lie to them because they already knew that it was pronounced against them that they were going to be destroyed. So obviously they got scared about that, which rightfully so. But uh, let's start reading again here in Joshua chapter 9. I know we just read the whole chapter, but let's reread some of this in verse number 3. The Bible says, And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wily and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles old and rent and bound up and old shoes and clouded upon their feet and old garments upon them and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. So they show up to Joshua. They put on their costumes, as it were. They want to make it look like they've just been traveling and traveling and traveling. It's been a, they've been a long time traveling. They've been on the road for a month or whatever, however long. You know, they're trying to make it appear as though you know, their, their shoes are all worn. The bottles that they brought with them to drink, they're all old and worn and dusty. And even the bread that they brought with them to eat, it's all moldy and stale. And they want to give off the impression that, oh yeah, we're from real far away. We, we just heard about the Lord or we want to join up with you guys and make a league with you. Now, there's a lot of different things that should have been... Um, popping up here with Joshua. And, and it does. He asks them in verse number seven, and the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, peradventure ye dwell among us. And how shall we make a league with you? So their very first thought is, well, you know, God's commanded us to destroy people. What if you live close by and you're one of the people that God has told us to destroy? And that's their number one concern, which should be their number one concern. But basically what happens here is they just, they lie to them. And they already have their evidence fabricated. 
that they're going to rely on to prove unto Joshua, oh, no, no, we don't live, we don't live among you. We just want to make a league with you. Now, first of all, God never said to make a pact or an agreement or a league with any nations. That, we, you know, no, the nation of Israel, as God's people, should not need to be relying on any nation or any other people outside of just relying on the Lord. The Lord is the one that's going to fight the battles for them. They don't need to be getting yoked up with anybody anyways. Making such an agreement is foolish. And I believe it's in the very next chapter, in chapter 10, where this same people, now that they make a league with, well, when the other nations hear that they've yoked up with Israel, they get angry at Gibeon because, you know, they, sh they didn't want them joining up with them. So they go to try to destroy them, and now all of a sudden they have to call on Israel to help and defend them. So now Israel's getting entangled and yoked up in a battle that's, that's technically not even theirs. Even though they were going to go and destroy these people anyways that are going to, to, to defeat them, they're getting themselves involved in things that they never should have gotten themselves involved with to begin with. There is no reason for them to make a league or a pact. They should just be independent and trusting in the Lord. That was their first mistake, but we see that their, their concern is about breaking God's commandments, but one of the things they never do is actually go to the Lord about this issue. And that's their biggest problem. But I'm not going to focus in on all of those details tonight because what I just want to show you is the method being used by these deceivers. And their intention for deceiving doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is they're going and lying to these people, to Joshua and to these elders of the, of the land in order to get something from them. And they're willing to lie for it. And we're going to see the tactic that they used. So it says here in verse number... Um, Eight, and they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye and from whence come ye? So their, his first question is, Well, wait a minute. How do I know you don't live among us? And then he's like, well, well, who are you and where are you from? Where are you coming from? And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come, because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt. Verse 10. And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sion, king of Eshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth, wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make ye a league with us. This our bread. So now they're going to point at their fabricated evidence that they already wanted to bring with, that they already knew they were going to have to use to prove to Joshua, oh, we're from real far. See, here's our evidence. Here's our proof. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you, which is a lie. But they're just trying to give the impression or the illusion that they really did come from a far place. And it says, um, behold, but behold, it is dry and mo it is moldy. And these bottles of wine which were filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these are garments, and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Now, there are multiple red flags here, but when it comes specifically to their deception, the red flag that I want to point out to you here is that they already had the way that they wanted to, to prove their lie. They already had the evidence pre-fabricated. You know, pre and Joshua kind of asks this open it. well, how do I know you're from far? Oh, see, here's how we know. Anyone that's going to try to, to tell you a lie, they're going to have a reason already kind of planned out in their head of what they're going to give you. But none of this was actually good evidence because it wasn't true. So I consider this to be very flimsy. It's just very surface, just on the surface of, uh, of um, you know, evidence. It's not real evidence at all of where they're from. Joshua should have been able to ask some more questions and maybe really grill them on it instead of just accepting what they were presenting to them. And one of the first red flags is when people just are real quick 
to provide some type of an evidence to you. You know, maybe, maybe you're, um, you're suspicious that someone might be lying to you. And this happens very frequently. Maybe someone's lying to you, um, trying to sell you something, okay? And they're going to start offering up just some extra information that you didn't even ask about and really trying to convince you. Now, obviously, in sales, you, you always want to try to prop things up, but to, to look as good as it possibly can. But oftentimes, people are very deceptive as well. And a, a good example of this is when they try to tell you, like, oh, this, this, there's nothing wrong with this, and this isn't broken. Um, oftentimes, it is. And they're saying there's the exact opposite to try to get you to to avoid it or to not look at it. Or if you start asking about one thing, they'll try to steer your attention somewhere else to the evidence they actually had already fabricated and try to control the conversation that way and to divert your attention from finding out the truth. So they want you to, to be focused on something else, something they've already planned out to give you evidence for. And you have to be aware of that. Now turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. We're probably going to deal with one of the biggest ways to identify when somebody's lying. Or at least when someone has it out for you, is trying to set a trap for you. Usually it's both. And the, the big red flag that should be popping up in your mind, besides someone just automatically trying to convince you with something, with just some, some manufactured evidence, which I know you're saying, you say, well, how do I know it's manufactured? Well, you don't always know it's manufactured, but when it's, when it's already, they already have a really well thought out plan to try to convince you as opposed to just answering something naturally. And this is where you need to be able to use discernment, but it should be a red flag. If someone already has their answer just ready to go, that ought to tell you, at least pop up some red flags saying, well, I don't think they're necessarily being honest about this. They've already been thinking about how they're going to answer some of these questions that might come up when I'm trying to validate whether or not they're being truthful with me. But the number two thing, or the, it's probably the biggest thing, is flattery. So we're going to look in Proverbs. Proverbs 29.5 says, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. Now flattery is, is when people are, not, it's not just a compliment, but when you are really trying to, um, to butter somebody up, as it were. It's a terminology that we use, you butter someone up, or you try to, to get someone just just give an overload of the compliments and really get them to, to feel, you know, try to lift someone up really high and elevate them and try to get them even maybe puffed up on just based on, on the, the adoration that, that a person gives them. That's flattery. And the Bible says that a man that flattereth his neighbor, he actually, he spreads a net for his feet. That he's trying to distract. Again, the deceit is that he's trying to make it look like or appear that he likes that you. He likes, he likes something about you. Maybe he thinks, you know, they're going to uh, try to appeal to your looks. Oh, you're so beautiful. You're so lovely. And just lavish you with all these compliments. Or, oh, you're so smart. You're so intelligent. Oh, man, you're way smarter than everybody else. You know, you should, ha you should have an honorary doctorate, whatever. You're just, 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 just laying it on. The reason why it's flattery and the reason why people aren't generally very good at it is because it's not genuine. They're, 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 they have an ulterior motive. They're trying to set a trap. They're trying to gain your confidence. So what happens is that these deceivers will usually take things too far. They go a little bit overboard because they're really trying to gain your trust. They're really trying to get you to buy into it. They're really trying to get you to like them. 
So in so doing, they really just, just lay on the flattery really, really thick. And when anybody tries to do that to you at all, you ought to have red flags popping up because the Bible says that a man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. They're trying to set a trap for you. They're tricking you. They're trying to deceive you with their words to harm you. Proverbs chapter 6, look at verse number 23. The Bible says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. So the Bible saying here, you know, God's commandments, his instructions, they are reproofs. This is going to give you the way of life, what things to do that are right, and they will help to keep you from the evil woman, the woman who's looking to do damage, the woman who's looking to destroy you and use the flattery of her tongue to destroy. Verse number 25, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned. So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house, but whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. We see here the adulterous woman that hunts for the precious life, that is evil, and that is trying to get a man to commit adultery against his wife. So what tactic does she use? She bats her eyes. She tries to make herself look outwardly as beautiful as possible and flatters the man and lays the compliments and really tries to get the man to be deceived by all of her flattery. And the Bible is just telling us here and just giving this great warning saying, look, a whorish woman, that's what is a whore, a whore that goes around and tries to commit adultery. It's a whore that goes around and, and is trying to have that relationship with men that are married. A whore does that. By means of a whorish wo woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. It will destroy your life. Now look, I know that this is using a man being deceived by a woman and by the flattery of a woman because that is probably going to be more common. But that is not the only way that adultery happens. It happens the other way around as well. So ladies, don't just think that it's the men that have to be worried about the flattery of a woman. Ladies, you need to watch out for the flattery of men too because that happens all the time. Maybe even more so probably even more so, where the man is going to flatter a woman and tell her, oh, how beautiful and how great she is and how great she looks and lay on all of the compliments because they're only interested in one thing. And they don't care if you're married. They don't care if it's going to destroy your family. The woman's hearing all these compliments thinking that, Oh, wow, this guy really loves me. Wow, I, my husband just isn't doing it anymore. He doesn't cut it for me. He just seems to be busy all the time. He doesn't seem to have time for me. And now here's this guy over here who just tells me how great I am and I love to hear and I love the attention and I love the affection. But he's out to destroy you because he doesn't care about you. He cares about himself. He cares about gratifying his flesh. And when he's done with you, he's going to toss you aside because he doesn't really love you. Because if he really loved you, he'd care about you and he'd care about your family and he'd care about your life not being destroyed. But he doesn't or she doesn't. The whore, the whoremonger, the adulterer, the adulteress, they don't care. Watch out for the flattery because that's how they'll do it. And in this day and age, and I'm going to be preaching an entire sermon about this soon, but in this day and age, you better watch it. You better watch your actions. You better limit your actions on the internet because sin has gotten to be so 
easy to commit. The doors are just wide open because there's no more accountability because it's just there's something the, the, the Internet has made sinning, especially grievous sins, especially when it comes to adultery and fornication and things like this. It has gotten so easy to be anonymous to try to do things without anyone else knowing that there's all these secret private ways you could build these fake profiles and fake accounts to go off and cheat on your husband or cheat on your wife and have relations with somebody else through some online relationship. It's wickedness. It's wickedness. It's horrible. It's disgusting. And it destroys lives every single day. Verse 32 there says, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. That's a pretty serious sin. And when you get online, don't, don't start getting involved in these chats and everything else. Sometimes people get involved with these, video, with these games, just real simple, innocent games, and then people start talking to you, and you start having this conversation with somebody, and no one else knows you're having that conversation because it's all digital, it's all online. No one even knows. No one can see. There's no record. There's no history. And you could just have these, these weird, wicked relationships online. And usually they start off by someone just flattering, flattering, flattering. Don't be deceived. Turn to Proverbs 7. Next chapter, Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs 7, verse number 4, the Bible says, Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. There's a flattery again. The woman that flatters. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding passing through the street near her corner and he went the way to her house in the twilight in the evening in the black and dark night and beheld and behold there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart she is loud and stubborn her feet abide not in her house now is she without now in the streets and lieth and waited every corner so she caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face said unto him i have peace offerings with me this day have i paid my vows Therefore came I forth to meet thee. She had this, that's why I came forth to meet you. Diligently to seek thy face, I have found thee. Talk about flattering. She said, wow, I've just been looking for you. I've never even met you before, but I've been, all of this I've done because I've been seeking you and I finally found you. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He had taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, look at this, verse 21, with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. It's his flat, her flattering, her compliments, her just continually talking to this guy and telling him how much she's been looking for him and she loves him and, oh, we're going to have our love and everything's going to be great. And she's done all this. The flattering of her lips, she forced him. That was the tool that she used to get him to commit a wicked sin. Verse number 22, he goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasted to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Like a dumb animal. The book of Proverbs is trying to give us wisdom, trying to give you knowledge, trying to help you to understand. Watch out for the flatterer, the person who used flattery. That is a huge red flag that someone's trying to deceive you. They're being deceptive. They're setting a trap for you. And don't forget, when you find someone like this, what the Bible says about the liar, the person that will lie to you, 
Proverbs 26, 28 says, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. Sometimes people who are really close to you will lie to you and they want to cover up their sins and they'll, they'll tell you different lies and maybe they're even setting a trap for you. And that could be very hard. That could be very difficult to go through. Maybe, you know, people's spouses sometimes will get caught up in adultery and wickedness and will end up lying to their own spouse the person that they're supposed to be able to trust. And they lie to them and they lie to their face. The Bible says a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. And a flattering mouth, mouth worketh ruin. The people that are willing to lie to you don't love you. They hate you. Now, I'm not saying, well, if my spouse lies, we go off and get a divorce because that's not what the Bible says that you're supposed to do. If you make a vow to death to his part, that's the vow. But don't, don't allow yourself to continue to be deceived. If you find out that someone close to you has been lying to you, it's not a good situation by any means. But... Don't be a fool about it. You're going to have to deal with it. But don't just be, don't just go and stick your head in the sand as if nothing happened. Understand the Bible says that when they're lying to you like that, they hate you. They don't care. They don't care about you. They don't care what damage their lie is going to do to you. Turn if you would to Judges chapter 14. It's going to be a little bit shorter sermon this evening. So we saw the people that, that fabricate their evidence and just want to point to certain things when they tell their lies that they've already planned and prepared and they're real quick to be able to present that evidence. Sometimes people will even do that without you even asking. And that is a huge red flag. When someone tries to pre present you evidence as to why they're telling the truth when you haven't even questioned them, that is a huge red flag. They're jumping the gun. It's not natural. See, naturally you have conversations with things and naturally you shouldn't be thinking about why you should always have to prove your own innocence. Because it should just be assumed that you're telling the truth. You shouldn't have to go to people and tell them all the reasons why you're not lying. And when people start doing that to you, that, that you would have no reason to suspect that they're lying, that, that alone is a, is a big red flag to say, well, wait a minute, why are you telling me all of this? Why are you presenting all this information to me? Why would I even think that you're lying? It's because they have a guilty conscience. And they know they're lying, and they're trying to convince you that they're not. And they go overboard. Just like the person goes overboard with the flattery, people go overboard with trying to prove their own innocence when they haven't even been accused of anything. That is another red flag of deception. And lastly, what we're going to be looking at here is the person that will project their own sins onto other people who are righteous, who are doing things right or judging others of things that they're guilty of in order to hide their own sin. They want to try to turn the tables and turn the attention off of themselves and put focus onto somebody else. That is a tactic that a deceiver will use. If someone's getting close to finding out, maybe, or they're, they're fearful that, that they might be caught, they're going to try to shift the blame off to someone else and accuse someone else of doing the very things that they do. Turn if you want to Judges chapter 14, we're going to start reading here in verse number 15. We're going to see this story. And this isn't the perfect illustration. We're going to get to a better one in a minute. But we see the story of Samson and his wife. And her own deception against him. Now, as I mentioned in our first example, the... the reasoning or the purpose behind their deception is, is irrelevant to what I'm preaching on tonight. So in this story, the people, you know, 
had threatened Samson's wife that they would kill her and her family's house and all this stuff if she didn't get the answer from, to the riddle from Samson. So she had a motive to do this, yet she's still being deceptive. She's still not being truthful. And she's still trying to get some information from him. And we'll see the way that she does this. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they, may, they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not so? And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of her people. Here we see her deception and trying to say, oh, you hate me. Now, remember what the Bible says about the lying lips actually hates the person that is afflicted by it. And she's trying to say, oh, you hate me. Instead of being honest with Samson and saying, hey, I was threatened. That would have been the right thing to do to her husband. Tell your husband, why don't you start off by telling your husband the truth? instead of starting off your marriage by telling your husband a lie. She lies to him and then tries to tell him, oh, you hate me. Oh, you're withholding this from me. No, you're the one that's withholding. You're the one that's not being truthful. Samson here is not being dishonest. He's not telling lies. But she's projecting that on him and saying, oh, you hate me. Oh, why won't you? You don't love me. Why can't you tell me this? Why can't you share everything with me? When she's the one that's not sharing everything and tries to make him actually feel guilty for something that he didn't even do anything wrong and she's the one in the wrong. The liar will do that all the time. Unfortunately, in this situation, oftentimes it can be hard to identify, but here's the thing, when you know that you're right, when you know that you're doing right and you're not doing anything wrong and people are just accusing you of stuff, be careful and you should have red flags coming up that maybe it's them that's doing those things and not you. I've heard story after story of people involved in relationships or married and they say, oh, you know, I think you're cheating on me. And the person's not doing anything wrong at all. It's just they're working hard, they're upright, they're serving God, and they're just being accused of, you know, being an adulterer or something along those lines. When in reality, there's nothing that they're doing wrong, but what they're doing is they're trying to make the other person look bad or feel bad because they themselves are guilty of that sin. The people that project their own sins will also lie and play the victim, right? They'll try to make it look like, oh, I'm the victim here, as opposed to being the wicked person that they are. There's a story that happened when we had the, the mega marathon in Mayer. There were two guys that were sent into a mobile home park. And the very first door that they knocked on, now look, when we went, it was broad daylight, beautiful day outside. It wasn't super early in the morning. It wasn't real late in the evening. It was a normal time for people to be up and out and about. They walk into this place. The very first door they knock on was some God-hating reprobate. Some God-hater that, that just was infuriated that they were out and preaching the gospel. So, of course, as God-hater, they can't just say, oh, no, thanks, you, no, thank you, I'm not interested. They have to follow them and harass them and just try to get them kicked out. They're doing everything that they can. I actually received phone, I got these voicemails from that day from this God-hater, and they kept coming up with all these lies, saying, oh, there's these two really big guys here that they say they're from your church. And look, they're being upfront and honest. They have the literature with them. Say, so yeah, we're, we're from this church. We're inviting people to church. We're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
They have Bibles in their hands and they're trying to get away from this person who doesn't want to hear it, yet they won't leave them alone. You know, people want to want to blame us or, or try to try to accuse us as, oh, don't cram your religion down my throat. Look, when we go out and try to preach the gospel, if someone doesn't want to hear it, we leave. You don't get into these vain arguments and fights because it's a waste of our time. Yet you have the same people that are going to say, oh, yeah, you're trying to cram your religion down my throat. That won't leave us alone. That won't leave them alone. Just going out and doing a thing, trying to leave them behind. And they won't do it. But one of these messages said, oh, yeah, we got these two big guys here. They're young. There's nothing. You know, I fear for my safety. So they're trying to play the victim and lying about, about reality. They're not in fear for their safety, but they're trying to play this victim because they're wicked in their heart and they're a deceiver. And they're going to say anything that they can to try to get their way or get their own outcome. They, they actually said, oh, I think they might be casing the joint. And there's nothing we go, oh, this is a senior community, and they're scaring everybody here because they're these young guys. Just a whole bunch of lies, trying to play the victim. In reality, it was just some God hater, and they knew exactly what they were doing. But they're, they're willing to just lie through their teeth about it and just come up with anything under the sun. And, at, you know, these deceivers, they'll try to throw anything against the wall and see what sticks. That should be a red flag for you, too. When someone changes their story, they tell you one thing. Oh, yeah, they're here. I think they're casing the joint. And then they tell you something else. They say, oh, well, no, actually, there's no soliciting here, so they shouldn't be telling you. Know, it's like, well, which one is it? Which one are you really concerned about? You're changing your story over and over and over again. You're obviously lying. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. We're going to see the story here of Joseph. And Potiphar's wife. Genesis chapter 39, we're going to start reading in verse number 7. The Bible reads, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and, said, and she said, Lie with me. So here we have his master's wife is wicked. And she's looking to commit adultery with Joseph. Joseph is upright. Joseph isn't doing anything wrong. Joseph is serving his master and he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Yet his master's wife is the one who's being wicked, who's trying to be an adulteress and trying to get Joseph to commit sin with her. Verse 8 says, But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, what if not? What is with me in the, in the house? And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He's saying, I've got everything here. What in the world do you think I'm going to do? Do you think I'm going to risk all this stuff for you? He's given me everything except for you because you're his wife. Of course he shouldn't give you to me. You're his wife. And he said, this is wicked. Don't come to me with this garbage. You, you are trying to get me to sin against God. He's not having it. Verse number 10, and it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So she's trying to press issues, trying to do this wicked thing. She's the one that's guilty. He runs away. He doesn't have anything to do with it. He flees. He does the right thing. Even when, when she's really being forceful with him, he, he gets out of there. Verse number 13, and it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in in Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. 
and she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. She was the one that was guilty. She was the one that didn't want to be caught for her wickedness. So instead, what does she do? She tries to flip it around on Joseph. She wants to accuse the innocent guy, the righteous man, of doing the very sin that she wanted to commit, the one that she was guilty of in her heart. Watch out for that. Let that be a red flag to you. I've seen it wait. My, my own just personal experience with many people, I've seen it happen too many times. You have a, a, a godly man or a godly woman, and they're just doing what's right. They're living their life, trying to do their best to serve God, trying to do their best to live a right life, to do the right thing. All of a sudden, these accusations start coming at them from their wife or girlfriend or whatever, or their husband or, you know, whoever it is. And they start accusing them of doing wickedness when it's the farthest thing from their mind. And so many times, the reason for their, for their lies or for their accusations is because they are projecting their own sin upon them. Because they're thinking like, well, I'm doing all this stuff, so he must be doing it or she must be doing this. And they're going to try to make them feel bad and put them on the defensive so that they don't face the attacks and try to deflect any attention towards them and focus on the other person. Because they don't want anyone looking at them and scrutinizing their actions so that they would get caught. That is a huge red flag. When you know you're doing right and you start getting all these accusations of you doing wrong, you know what's most likely the case is that that person is doing the wrong. Turn if you go to Romans chapter 2. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Romans chapter 2. Because the people that will, will do that, that will project their sin upon you, what they're actually doing is that they're judging unrighteous judgment. Because they're the hypocrite. They're the one that's guilty of the sin and they're trying to judge you of being guilty of something that you didn't do. Romans 2, verse number 1. Of course, Romans 1 describes the reprobate. Romans 1, at the end of Romans 1, gives a whole list of all these sins that the reprobate is just full of all wickedness and all, all the, the, the sin that they're full of and the abominable works. And then Romans chapter 2 Verse number one starts off saying, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. And you better be careful if you're the liar, if you're the deceiver, if you're the one that's trying to project your sin on someone else, you better watch out and take heed to these words in the Bible and God's word. Because you're condemning yourself. For thou that judges doest the same things. The Bible says you condemn yourself. Verse number two. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? <coughs> Be careful. You reap what you sow. And with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged again. With what measure ye meet, it shall be meted unto you. But too often the deceivers have no fear of God. And they know what the Bible says and they don't care. Because their heart is wicked. Jump down to verse number 17 in Romans 2. The Bible says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore that which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man 
should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. These people who want to tout the law and how great and how holy they are, and just tell everybody and let everybody know how great they are and how wicked everyone else is, they're the ones that usually have the most problems. Now, don't confuse what I'm saying with someone who just preaches the truth out of God's law. Someone who says, this is what God said, this is what the Bible says, and condemns all sin. That's not the same as someone saying, I'm so great, and I'm so perfect, and I'm so obedient to God's law, and I am I'm all these things, and, and these people are all so wicked. When you're trying to lift up yourself and bring other people down, usually it's, it, the, the, again, the red flag is that they're trying to cover for their own sins, for their own problems, for their own things that they have done. So I hope this sermon helps you to understand and see, spot some of the red flags of someone who's trying to deceive you. Because the closer that people are to you, the harder it can be. And I'm not trying to get people on a witch hunt within your own family or, or whatever, things like that. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of information, just a little bit of wisdom this evening on how to just be able to be on guard and protected whether, no matter where, who the person is. If they're starting to, to meet, you, you know, the, some of the things I'm, I'm preaching tonight, you start to say, yep, that, 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 wow, all these things. I'm thinking about one person in particular. All of these things are, have happened recently. Then I would just advise you to be very careful about how you deal with that person and, and how you receive any information or anything that they're telling you. If you can't trust what they're saying and be able to Maybe ask some more thorough questions. Go to God and ask God for the wisdom. Ask God for the judgment. That was what Joshua's mistake was. He never went and sought counsel of the Lord. He just relied on the faulty evidence that was provided to him. So watch out for the people who are just trying to convince you of their, their truth and their innocence without you even accusing them. And they just giving you all kinds of evidence when you didn't even ask for it. Watch out for the people who flatter and try to just lay it, lay it on thick and give you all kinds of compliments and try to lift you up way more than would be considered normal as just a normal compliment. And watch out for the people that want to project their sin on you when you know you're not doing anything wrong and people are just accusing you of things. Watch out for those things. Those are red flags. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom that we can receive from your words. God, I pray that you would please help us to be able to discern truth from people and that you would open up our, our, our knowledge, our understanding, dear Lord, and that we wouldn't have to learn all of these things just through experience, but that we could learn them in advance without having to go through them and having to be burned by people, um, that we'd be able to spot when people are laying a trap for us or, or trying to deceive us, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us all to be truthful in our communications, in our lives, and that we wouldn't bring a bad name or bring a reproach upon your name, dear Lord, um, as we saw in Romans chapter 2, that the, that the people who touted your law were actually bringing a, a reproach upon the name of the Lord because the Gentiles would see their actions and see the things that they say and that they didn't match up and they were just hypocrites. Pray that you please help us not to be hypocrites and be able to just have discernment and knowing what the truth is and what, and, and what the lies are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.